Hello, I understand. I'm audible. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, uh, I'll just bring up my screen before bringing up my screen. Do we have any doubts from the previous chapters? Uh, uh, we were talking so, about the yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I didn't get chance to go through the entire reading of the chapters from the CMP. Yeah. But yeah, until what I have read, uh, I don't yeah. have any. Nothing. So like it's yeah. all clear, right? Uh, regarding with profit surplus, just like we basically went through the various uh, methods, approaches that a company follows while uh, uh, distributing profits, the additions to benefit, reval and uh, contribution. So mainly used in UK, CE and US respectively. And uh, like we'll mainly focus on the additions to the benefit approach when it comes to if you look at the questions like most of the, most of the questions assume that uh, like it's coming from the additions to the benefits approach, but yeah, they do have points from the reval and uh, contribution methods as well. So uh, like maximum number of marks will be scored from the additions to the benefit approach, but you will have to equally keep in mind that reval and contribution exists and maybe provide a couple of points for each of them for each question. Like when we look to the questions of the booklet, you will see that pattern. Um, about that's about that i guess if there are no questions then i think we can start with the next chapter yeah 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 i'll bring up my screen just let me know when it's visible it is visible visible perfect so uh here we, we like chapters 19 and 20 basically revolve around how how do uh, companies keep reserves and like meet their capital requirements which have been mainly set by the regulator of each territory. Now, like I think we discussed about reserves and supervisory capital requirement at the very beginning, like when we were going to product features. So if you could just uh, tell me what is your understanding about reserves and capital requirements? So um, about the reserve, it's basically uh, like talking the journal terms is basically the mm -hmm. PV of inflows minus the PV of outflows. And yeah. it is something uh, required over and above the um, over and uh, over and above the assets of the company just in case to meet any future uh, contingent liabilities. Mm -hmm. And um, and it uh, and I think it's something that becomes the part of the um, at, uh, okay, so it also comes the part of the solvency capital or it's the uh, mm -hmm. supervisory mm -hmm. something related. Right, right, right. So like you're almost there. So first of all, your reserves are basically the PV of outflow minus inflow. That is one thing. Uh, next, the main purpose of reserves, like uh, in different territories, different regulations have different uh, rules as to how reserves are calculated. Now reserves are the first, uh, like. Uh, how should I first protection that is provided to the stakeholders of the company that the company will be able to meet its future claims, future liabilities. So we simply take the PV of outgo minus PV of inflows here. Now, what's the trick here? Like, why is it uh, like, why, why does it protect the stakeholders? The main reason that uh, while calculating supervisory reserves, uh, we are able to protect the stakeholders of the company is because these calculations, these outputs and inflows are calculated on a prudent basis. What do, I, what do I mean when I say prudent basis? That the assumptions that we use while projecting these future cash flows are usually uh, projected on some prudent assumptions. Like what are prudent assumptions? For example, if I'm talking about a term contract where the key assumption is mortality, I'll say uh, the regulator in that particular territory has said spike your assumptions up for mortality by 10% and then calculate your future outflows and inflows. So what will happen to my future outflows? My debt outflows will increase in the future because my assumed mortality rate has increased. For example, if I was assuming 10 debts to occur in a particular year, now I'm assuming 11 debts to occur. So my like future expected payout has increased from 10 into the total sum assured, from 10 into total sum assured to 11 into total sum assured, right? Yes. Yeah, so my future outgo, future uh, cash outflows have uh, increased. Similarly, because my number of debts have increased, the total number of lives in enforce at every point will fall down. If number of lives remaining at a future point of time uh, was 10 minus 10 equals 90 previously, now it has come down to, uh, sorry, 100 minus 
1090 previously it has come down to 100 minus 1189 now so the premium receivables at that point of time also falls down so my pv of inflows will also fall down so because of using a prudent set of assumptions i'm increasing my pv of outflow minus pv of inflow and that is what supervisory reserve stands for that we are calculating our pv of outflow minus inflow on a prudent basis of valuation such that we are able to protect like in a way overstating our uh, future liability to be able to make sure that we are able to meet them in the future as well make sense um so wouldn't it be a kind of set off in your example like if the mortality has increased so, mm -hmm. um like outflow would go up and inflow yeah. would go down so right. wouldn't it be a, a set off between when we are calculating the reserve why uh, so outflow it's outflow minus inflow right a minus yeah. b a goes up b goes down so the total yeah. thing has all gone up right Okay. Ten minus two is eight. Eleven minus one is mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. ten. Got it. Yeah. Both mm -hmm. are in the opposite directions. Yeah. Now that's about supervisory reserves. Now equivalent to supervisory. Now reserves are the first step of protection that, uh, like the regulations provide to stakeholders of an insurance company. The second set of product protection is called a supervisory capital requirement. Going back to the reserves for a second. Uh, now we we talked about a prudent set of assumptions now this does not just include mortality this can have other things as well so a more prudent set of expense assumptions a more prudent set of lapse assumptions a more prudent say interest assumptions everything can be set to a more prudent level uh next you have something called like now th these are like if say your best estimate liabilities where you are you are not spiking up the assumptions set uh, you to hold 100 rupees worth of uh like uh money aside for right uh, right now but your supervisory reserves told you to hold 120 rupees because your outflows are increased inflows have fallen down right so far so good yeah yeah now the uh, regulator in that territory says 120 is not enough for me there can be many adverse events that can occur in the future uh you'll have to hold something over and above this and from what i from my perspective it should be at least 30% of uh, whatever reserves you are holding okay so 30% of 120 right right now that's another 36 so you should hold at least 156 of total assets in respect of the 100 worth of uh, well liability you have sold right now now this extra 36 that a company needs to hold is called supervisory capital requirements or solvency capital requirement which is over and above the supervisory reserves is this clear like yes there are two components of protection like whatever the company has to hold over and above the best estimate liability one is uh, the reserve component and the other is the solvency capital requirement component so uh, like now there are many regulations some regulation might say do not like your reserves are equal to the best estimate reserve you need not spike up your assumptions by anything so your reserves supervisory reserves will be 100 only but they will have a most stringent solvency capital requirement say they will put the solvency requirement itself up to 56% so at the end of the day you might be holding the same amount it's just that the split between the supervisory reserve and the solvency capital requirements is different so for example in uh, territories like australia and new zealand you have a supervisory reserve which is equal to the best estimate reserve but in territories but in most asian countries you have a padded set of assumptions for uh, your supervisory reserves and your solvency capital requirements are less strict uh, so where is the yeah so uh, mm -hmm. where there is this scr over and above the supervisory reserve so uh, below that we do have that uh, best estimate reserve also yeah like yeah, yeah. So the best estimate reserve is equal to 500 yeah yeah pv of outflow minus pv of inflow in the example we're talking about mm -hmm. yeah uh, but like if you think about it why would a like at the outset of a contract if i'm talking right when the contract is sold would you expect at your best estimate 
assumptions they are reserved to be positive not always maybe why um so uh, i think something related to the free assets would come up mm, not exactly so let's think about it um, what are your best estimate set of assumptions um those are uh, not that prudent not prudent or assumptions which show what is most likely to happen in the future yeah yeah so under those assumptions would you expect your outflows to be pv of outflows to be greater than pv of inflows or less than pv of inflows because the end motive of a company by selling any policy is to make profit out of it mm -hmm. yeah so they would want the pv of inflow to be greater than the pv of outflow yeah so under the best estimate set of assumptions you can always say uh, like you would always assume that if a company is selling profitable contracts the pv of outflow should be less than the pv of inflow yeah yeah that's why you would expect your best estimate liability that is your best estimate on your best estimate set of assumptions you would expect the pv of outflow to be less than pv of inflow but when you pad those assumptions up for your prudent valuation basis say spike assumptions uh, like mortality lapses then you would assume your um, uh, Uh, like there's a positive reserve to come in or your pv of outflow being pv of inflows right uh, no can you repeat that part like the under your best estimate assumptions your pv of outflow you would expect to be less than inflows is that clear yeah correct but mm -hmm. as soon as you pipe those assumptions up what is the what is the purpose of supervisory reserve to hold something to hold a reserve amount right to set something aside from your assets to be able to meet those future liabilities yeah right so a negative reserve would not make a lot of sense if your pv of mm -hmm. outflow less than so it would mean that you are not keeping some asset aside or if you are keeping some asset aside uh, previously you would not keep that aside a negative reserve would mean something like that yeah yeah so it it does not make a lot of sense if you are trying to protect the stakeholders of the company to provide a let's say like sense of protection to them so would expect the pv of outflows to be greater than the pv of inflows under the Uh, like supervisory reserve valuation basis, right? Where your assumptions are prudent. So your assum prudent assumptions are uh, like increase the PV of outflows enough or PV of reduce your PV of inflows enough to make your reserve a positive one. Okay, got it. Now uh, that's about like uh, right, like what are reserves and why are reserves held? So it has it is mainly. Help to make sure that the company's financial management is in position. Uh, like uh, they they are not like overselling policies or selling a lot of policies where uh, like the cash flow pattern is such which they won't be able to meet in the future. So it's make it's making sure that they are setting aside enough assets at present while selling the policy or at every point of time during the policy duration, so as to make sure that they'll be able to meet the future liabilities. yeah uh now uh the will the company use its supervisory reserves for every decision within the company will they be using like the supervisory reserve calculation for decision making always within the company what about that what do you think like what would be the choice that the company goes for like if say for example they want to take certain decisions about profitability of the company would they go for the supervisory reserves what do you all think any ideas about that so the basic thought process here is when you are talking about the profitability of the company when the management is taking decisions they would prefer to see a true picture of the future a picture of the future which is most probable to take place right which is most probable to occur in the future so they would most 
personally prefer a best estimate picture of the future rather than a padded uh like padded picture because that would present a more prudent uh, like picture which might not be uh like true in a sense because it has been uh, like padded up for like uh, more adverse events in the future than they expect to occur does this make sense so the the management of a company would most of the times want to look at a, a true picture or a picture that is unpadded or the best estimate assumptions that we were talking about to be able to uh, like understand the real profitability of the company in the future and to make uh, like strategic decisions uh, like as to how much policies to sell as to like uh, what uh, buckets to sell their policy in what risk classes to focus on most of these decisions are based on the best estimate results or the best estimate cash flows that are rising out all good till here um but this supervisor is something that is more uh, prudent than the uh, best estimate reserve so why yeah. didn't they take that part like it would give the better picture to them like it's considering um, as in the more more prudent picture to them but would it yeah. give a true picture to them would it give a picture uh, which is most probable to take place in the future no but uh, it is something that is considering um, like it it is something that is co- uh, covering up the major part of the liability that might occur maybe yeah yeah that's that's what the best estimate assumptions are also doing that they are covering all your liabilities of the future uh, in the most probable best why do you call it best estimate because they are the best estimate of the future like that's the number which is most probable to occur in the future okay, okay. on the other hand your padded assumptions are something you have just applied a prudent set of assumptions because the regulator has asked you to hold reserves on those uh, on that particular valuation basis it's not like uh, a company would be very happy to have a less prudent set of assumptions so their reserving requirements are low so their asset total asset that they need to set aside to sell a particular policy is also low right yeah but but like and that's the reason when when a company is going to an internal decision making process uh, they use a best estimate set of assumptions to calculate future cash flows to to be able to compute their profitability and like take st- strategic decisions accordingly now it makes sense yeah okay so do we only yeah. use supervisory reserves when say for regulation purposes sorry i missed your question mamaria um, okay so- when do we use the supervisory res- supervisory uh, supervisory reserves mm-hmm. so it's As basically regulation. yeah so it's basically being used to meet the regulations of a particular line so okay. your let your regulator might have certain guidelines in place to hold mm-hmm. reserves in a particular fashion uh, like and that fashion is generally to use a, a padded set of assumptions or a prudent set of assumptions uh, yeah. and if you if you use a prudent set of assumptions your pv of outflow goes up your pv of inflow generally goes down and you mm-hmm. have a higher reserve amount yeah yeah okay yeah that's fine cool uh now we'll look at how like these reserves are basically calculated uh now this is something we briefly not briefly like extensively had in our ct5 portion of cm1 uh where we had basically two methods the net premium valuation and the gross premium valuation so we'll see mostly the gpv method is used across companies for calculating uh, uh like supervisory reserves and uh, and it's on a red, uh, on a prospective basis so you remember when we were studying uh, gpv in ct5 we had two bases a retrospective basis and a prospective basis retrospective was when you looked into the uh, past and you like uh, Uh, looked into all the cash flows that have occurred till date and calculated a reserve uh, in that manner but when we talk about gpv for reserving we look into the future what are all the cash flows that are about to occur all the outflows all the inflows discount them and then calculate our uh, reserve at time t okay so uh, the formal definition of a gross premium valuation is basically a method for placing a value on a life insurance company's liabilities that explicitly values the future office premiums payable expenses and gains with the latter possibly including future discretionary benefits so basically you are taking three things into account 
your uh, premiums, which forms a part of your inflows. And this is future office premiums. So you are like netting it out for any taxes. When you are talking about office premiums payable, you are netting your gross premiums out for taxes. So it's your net premiums. And then you have a uh, uh, expenses and claims. Expenses and claims are basically your outflows. Uh, like expenses, whatever, like expenses include submissions here as well. So whatever expenses the company uh, expects expects to incur in the future and your expected claims in the future as well. Uh, so they have a, like, and now you have a couple of methods to cal calculate the GPV as well. The first is a GPV formula method where you are considering each cash flow in isolation to each other. So you have your uh, debt, uh, like whatever the claim outflow is, you have your uh, expense outflow and you have your premium inflow. So you are multiplying your sum assured by the assurance factor uh, for age X plus T and for remaining term of the policy N minus T. And then you're adding up uh, the renewal expenses for every year with the annuity due factor at age X plus T and for the remaining term N minus T. And similarly subtracting the PV of premiums by taking into consideration the office premium speed dash and multiplying again by the annuity due factor for uh, age X plus T and remaining term N minus T. So you have assumed that the total term of the policy here is N years. Now the issue age was age X and T years have elapsed since the uh, inception of the policy. Does this formula make sense to everyone? Yeah, just a quick question. This office premium is a uh, net of tax, right? Net of taxes, yeah. Okay. Any doubts, Alavanya? All good? Yeah, all good. So, uh, if, if you think about it, like, uh, again, uh, what we discussed at the very beginning was, like, if, if, you, if you think about it, uh, if, if a padded set of assumptions are not being used, you would expect this equation to give a through a negative number because your PV of inflows should exceed your PV of outflows. But because we would be using a padded set of assumptions, a more prudent valuation basis, uh, your outflows, uh, a PV of outflows will should be greater than the PV of inflows in order to in order for the contract to be non onerous or to be profitable, and hence uh, you get a positive reserve amount or a positive uh, amount out of this equation. Now, the second method of calculating your GPV is the cash flow method. Now, there's not a lot of focus focus around it, just that uh, they have a, a fancy way that you calculate your net cash flow at each point of time in the future. So instead of considering each outflow and inflow in isolation to each other, what you do is you ex, uh, like uh, calculate your net cash flow at each point of time. So you do a expected claims plus expected uh, expenses minus expected premiums at each time in the future. Then you have your net cash flow at each time period. Then you discount that using the, uh, uh, like in whatever interest rate that you have assumed in your uh, valuation basis. So it's, it's, uh, it's like the answer will be exactly equal to the formula method. It's just that you would be able to, uh, like you, you would have an additional step where you're calculating the net cash flow at each point of time and then discounting it back. The method makes sense. Why do you think uh, like insurance companies would want to uh, look at this method? Like calculate the net cash flow at each point of time and then discount it back. Why does this method, why would this method be preferred by any insurance company? So that they can keep up with the changes, like at any point of time, if they uh, see that the cash flows would have gone uh, somewhere around, then they could keep up with the reserves accordingly. However, in the other method, uh, it's like the aggregate picture that we are seeing in total. Yeah. So in the other method, you don't have a, uh, you don't get a peek into what is the cash flow pattern in the future. You just know, like there can be a large outflow at the very end or there can be equal outflows spread across, across the years, or your inflows can be skewed, or your outflows can be skewed. But in your uh, formula method, you are not able to uh, observe the pattern of your cash flows as to how much cash do you want at every point of time, right? There might be a possibility that 
at the very end of the contract, you need a large outflow, which generally happens for a term policy or for an endowment policy. But that might not be very well portrayed by a uh, formula method. So this cash flow approach, where you're calculating the net cash flow at each point of time, tells you whether you have positive or negative cash flows everywhere and what is the size of that cash flow. And then you can uh, discount it using the term structure of interest rates, whatever you have. Another problem here being uh, when you are calculating assurance factors at AD, like annuity factors, you generally use a set rate of interest rate, right? You do not, you can't use a variable uh, interest rate pattern there. On the other hand, when you have a cash flow, uh, like cash flow structure, like a loan uh, schedule structure, you can apply a variable interest rate pattern there, a term structure there, to uh, like discount every cash flow at a different forward rate of the future. So it becomes easier for you to apply a term structure of interest rates as well to be able to uh, discount your cash flows in a more, uh, how should I put it, in a more accurate fashion. Right? And at times what happens for unit link, link contracts or for contracts which have a uh, significant investment proportion, most of the times your charges, your expenses, are expressed as a percentage of premiums or sum assured at every point of time. Right? Or for example, in cases where there are guarantees, uh, which depend on your sum assured and your uh, premium paid till date or uh, like whatever factors which are constituting uh, in the like factors which, which are vary by time. So at every point of time, your cost of guarantee might be different. So calculating that might, uh, like the calculation of those elements might depend on whatever is the sum assured at each point of time. Your sum assured might increase or decrease. Your premiums might not have a level pattern. So your GPV formula method would get more and more complicated with time if you stick to using the formula, uh, like the flat out formula. Uh, instead, if you uh, make a cash flow projection of the same policy, you'd be able to uh, estimate those cash flows uh, like much more easily. You'd be uh, like estimate though you'll be able to estimate those expenses and charge structures in a more uh, like streamlined fashion. Make sense? Any doubts, sir? Um, I have a question. You yeah. know, in the office premium, I know it's net of tax, but where is the commission coming? Do we consider commission anywhere? And get your point here. Sorry. Um, you know how in premiums and stuff, there will be a commission that will be deducted. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah. So does the commission come anywhere in the so, form? Yeah, so the commission is like when you when you're calculating. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, the GPV. You always mm -hmm. take into account all your outflows. So your expenses and commissions both are being taken into account. So either okay. you are like subtracting it out of premiums or adding it onto the expenses. Okay. Yep, that's fine. Any other doubts? Uh, in that case, um, let's move to the next part. Uh, where we have, we, when we specifically talk a lot about unit linked policies. Now, we discussed about this while we were, I think, uh, talking about unit pricing or like there was a particular chapter, I think chapter five, which was dedicated, chapter four, which was dedicated to unit link products, where we had uh, talked about how while calculating reserves for unit link products, we split the entire reserve amount into two portions, the unit reserves and the non-unit reserves. The unit reserves are where like uh, you, you only take a present value of those cash flows which are to cater towards the unit liabilities of the company. So, uh, like the liabilities, which basically uh, include whatever amount you need to pay to the policyholder in respect of the units that are held for that particular policyholder. So, total amount of units multiply the total value of asset, uh, like uh, by the value of one unit uh, that is held at each point of time is your unit reserve. If you think about it. Uh, and you also subtract what is the present value of whatever premiums you are about to receive, which will be allocated towards units. That is what unit reserves consist of. And whatever the insurance company needs to hold from a, a part of this 
reserve is called a non unit reserves now what can you think of all the additional cash flows that a uh, company has to take care of for a unit link product uh like if you think about the, the charges, of, the charges. Uh, charges and yeah. um commissions expenses like the initial or uh, yeah 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 okay okay anything else if you think about uh, administration all, cost administration cost okay all expenses all charges you can think about like we have we started about uh, unit link products where you have a minimum like some assured so even if your unit value falls below the guaranteed sum assured the company will anyhow pay that guaranteed sum assured on debt yeah so we can think so this is a guarantee or an option like uh, that we uh, that we started right this is a cost of guarantee so you can think about the mortality cost of the difference between the sum assured and the unit value at each point of time this cost of guarantee should also be included in the non unit reserves yeah yeah similarly you can have a uh, like like cost of withdrawal the cost of lapses uh, in case your guaranteed surrender value exceeds the unit reserve at any point of time or you can have other guarantees uh, like uh, in the future as well where you have a minimum maturity benefit so we also talked about unit link policies where companies promise that you will at least on a 3% per annum interest rate whatever the market conditions might be so the cost of not being able to meet that minimum interest rate of return that can also be taken into account on the uh, non unit reserve so basically you will take into account all your expenses charges you will take into account all your mortality charges in excess of uh, the un uh, like unit fund you will take into account all the cost of guarantees and options so it is non unit reserve is basically the pv of all non unit cash flows uh, outflows minus pv of non unit inflows now again uh, like the source of profit for this for any company selling a unit link policy would be these charges and expenses right so you would again expect the pv of outflow minus inflow to be negative yes does this make sense yeah Uh, so yeah. are we saying the expenses and the charges of for the investment would be much higher than what they would get out of any? Yeah. Uh, so what we're trying to say here is, uh, if you think about a unit link business, under mm-hmm. the unit fund part of it, uh, under the unit reserve part, reserve part of it, uh, the insurance company say receives hundred rupees from the policy holder right now. It deducts ten mm-hmm. percent as charges. and invest the remaining 90% into a certain fund now the liability in respect of that fund is whatever the investment value is at the mm-hmm. point of maturity or at a point of claim so there is nothing more or less money that there is no money that the invest uh, that the insurance company can make or lose out of the unit fund portion of it the 90 rupees part of it because mm-hmm. whatever is the fund value they will pay to the policy holder yeah what where's the opportunity for the policy holder uh, sorry for sorry for the insurance company to make or lose money it is how it manages the money uh, the uh, remaining 10 rupees which which it has imposed as charges mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and this uh, and this charges is basically uh, catered towards meeting the expenses of the company the administrative expenses the cost of guarantees the cost of any options mm-hmm. yeah yeah so what what would the, would the company expect that a pv of all the charges that i have imposed on the policy holder is less is greater than or less than the total amount of expenses they they will incur in the future it will be less will be the charges will be greater right they would want to charge higher yeah yeah they would want to charge higher so as to make a profit out of the policy mm-hmm. yeah. yeah like they like at the end of the day it's a profit making enterprise so yeah. they would Uh, want to make a profit out of it because they can't like make anything out of the unit por- portion of the business. They focus on the non-unit portion, so as the charges they impose would be higher than the actual expenses they incur, and uh, make a profit out of this. 
So okay. naturally, you would assume that the PV of non-unit outflows would be greater than the PV of non-unit inflows. Sorry, less than the PV of non-unit inflows. Yeah. Yeah. So your non-unit reserve would be again negative if you calculate it on a best estimate approach. Reserves. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anushka, is this clear? Yeah. Yeah. So that's why uh, now uh, different legislations can have different rules as to whether non-unit reserves can be negative or not. Like negative reserves can be held or not. Most of the times, it's a it's the regulation that you have to zeroize any negative reserves. So in a sense, no company would be able to held uh, uh, like uh, hold any negative reserves in respect of any policy. But again, a lot of legislation is in. Uh, rules and legislation are present uh, in territories. In some territories, you would be able to hold, but wherever you will be able to hold, there will be uh, many rules around it, and there are some rules that we'll study about here as well. Uh, before delving into that, we'll just look at what are the couple of ways in which non-unit reserves can be calculated. The first way is, is the prudent approach or the prudential approach that they call it. Uh, what what do we do here is we first of all uh, project all our future cash flows, uh, like all the net cash flows of the future. So we'll do all of inflow minus outflow in, in the future at time zero, at time one, time two, time three, whatever is the net cash flow at that point of time, we'll first project that cash flow sheet. Now, uh, at any point of time, if the net cash flow is positive, which means if I inflows minus outflows is positive, uh, do we need to hold a reserve for that? in the time period right before that say for example uh, i make a cash flow scheme that looks like this just a second this is time and this is net cf and this looks like this so zero one two three four it's a five four year policy and my cash flows at time is minus two minus three sorry And then I have a positive of four, I have a minus two, and then I have a minus three. Uh, sorry, three. So at time three, if I am uh, like, uh, sorry, at time four, if I have a uh, positive net cash flow, so my inflow minus outflow uh, is positive. So do you think at the start of time three, do I need to hold any reserve? Because my future cash flow anyway is going to be positive. Right? I know at time four, the premiums I will receive would be greater than the claims I would be paying. So should I hold any reserves at, at this point of time? No. No? So at this point of time, at time three zero, three plus, at time three plus, that is right after time three plus, my reserve will be zero. Yeah, because I'll zeroize any negative reserve. If I would have to hold any reserve, it would be minus three. If I ignore interest rates right now, it would generally be three into uh, one plus i to the power minus one. That is three by one plus i, right? Minus of three into one plus i. If negative reserves were allowed to be held, yeah. But in this case, I cannot hold any negative reserves. So my reserve for the cash flow three is zeroized. So I cannot hold anything here. Make sense? Now, if I think about the start of time two, I'll consider only this cash flow minus two because at time three plus my reserve is already zero. So I'll just take back this cash flow minus two, one time period back. Now, assuming a zero interest rate, if I discount it back by one, it's minus two, right? So at time two plus, what will be the reserve that I'll be required to hold? Minus two. Minus two or two, right? Because the reserve is yeah. outflow minus it's positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, reserve is two. Now at time two, my cash flow is positive four. Yeah. So what will be the now at and I already have a reserve of two at uh, time two plus. So if I do a two minus four, again my reserve will become minus two negative. 
So what will be the reserve that we, I'll hold at uh, time one plus? Sorry. See you. Zero. Yeah, because you will be zeroizing any negative reserves. Mm -hmm. I cannot hold any negative reserves. Yeah. So I again start with minus three or three at time zero plus. So at time zero plus, my reserve would become three. Yeah, because I'll be taking back just this one cash flow of minus three. So we'll start from the last. So we have explained this in this manner. We start with the last projection period where the net cash flow is negative. So that is time three and back calculate the reserves. We keep discounting them back one time period by one time period. If the reserve at any point at any given point of time is negative, we zero, we zero is the same and then move backwards again. Does this make sense? Uh, just had the question with that time uh, one plus. So uh, at time one plus, we had this positive cash flow, and uh, mm. before that, we had uh, the reserve of two. So mm. um, not understood at the part that why uh, we landed to the zero at time one plus. So if you think about it, there's a positive cash flow of net out cash flow of four. So if I were yeah. to calculate a reserve, it would become two minus four. Yeah, which becomes minus two. Minus okay, and we will zero as it. Okay, we zero as it. Zero as it. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is when we are not considering considering any interest rates. If you would consider interest rates, we just discount the same every year by the rate of interest rate applicable every year. Yeah. Now the this is your prudent approach. The next approach is your best estimate valuation. In this case, negative reserves can be held. Negative non-unit reserves can be held. So you do not need to worry about whether your net net cash flow is positive or negative. You just calculate your reserve as it is for every point of for every. So at time three or uh, three plus, your reserve will be minus three. Then it will become one. Then it will become minus three. Then minus six. Then minus eight. Sorry, I think I made a calculation mistake. Yeah, it will be minus three, then one, uh, then minus one. Yeah. So you just consider all your net cash flows, whether it's positive or negative. You will discount the same, and you will get your uh, best estimate valuation reserve at each point of time. Is this clear as well? Any doubts there? I'll take that as no doubts. Moving on to the next part, where we'll talk about like what uh, in regulations where you can hold negative non-unit reserves. Uh, like what are the rules that you generally need to follow? The first uh, rule that most legislations have in place is that the sum of your unit and non-unit reserves should always exceed any guaranteed sum. Uh, sorry, any guaranteed surrender values. So. Uh, in policy literature, while selling out a uh, policy, you might have def defined a surrender value at each point of time, a guaranteed surrender value at each point of time. Say it can be expressed as a percentage of unit fund, or it can be just uh, any nominal amount that they might have laid down in the policy literature. So you need to make sure that any point of time, uh, your non-unit plus unit reserves uh, at every point of time, at every point of time in the future, must exceed the guaranteed surrender value at that respective time period. The reason simply being, uh, you might have to pay out the guaranteed sub, uh, surrender value at every point of time if the policy lapses out, and if your reserve, uh, total reserve at that point of time is lower than that guaranteed amount, uh, you might not be in a very good position to be able to pay that money. So, the sum of your unit and non-unit reserves must exceed that guaranteed surrender value. The second being, the aggregate sum of all non a uh, unit reserves must not be negative. It should be either great, uh, greater, uh, it should be greater than or equal to zero. So, uh, on an individual policy level, you can have uh, like uh, individual policies which have a negative non-unit reserve. But on an aggregate level, when you sum up the non-unit reserves of all the policies, it should not be negative. Right uh, now, there's a 
particular concept of how you can think a non unit reserve uh, how you can think about a non unit reserve and uh, 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 like between policies which have a negative non unit reserve and a positive non unit reserve so a negative non unit reserve they say can be thought of as a loan from a policy which has a positive non unit reserve why uh, if 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 there's a negative non unit reserve you expect that contract to be profitable right and if you have a positive non unit reserve you expect that contract to be loss making so far so good the loss making and profit making portions any doubts there any doubts there guys no no, no. so uh like you can think that the loss making contracts are providing a loan to a to the profit making contract a negative loan in a sense which would be paid off by the profits of the negative non unit reserve holding policies because these negative non unit reserves are profit making they like uh, positive net cash flows would arise, arise in the future from these policies and these profits that would arise out of these policies uh, would be used to pay the loan back to the loss making policies make sense it's it's very notional uh, it's a very notional concept uh, like the loan term is very uh, loosely used here but if you think about it uh, because you can't hold a no negative non unit reserve explicitly on an aggregate level so you require a positive non unit reserve policy to be able to hold a negative non unit reserve on a certain policy so it's like the positive non unit reserve policy is giving out a loan to the negative non unit reserve policy to be able to hold that negative non unit reserve and what is the repayment from this non uh, negative non unit reserve policy the profits that will be arising out in the future because a non a negative non unit reserve policy will be profit making in general make sense any doubts yeah 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 okay. so uh, there's one more rule the last rule that we have in place for negative non unit reserve is that it should not be that the cash flow pattern of these two policies that we were talking about which are in a way subsidizing each other are very different uh, from one another if that is the case the profits that arise from the negative non unit reserve policy uh like uh, the uh, sorry the concept is that the profits that are arising out of the negative non unit reserve uh, uh uh policy should be in time when the negative cash flows of the positive non unit reserve policy is occurring it should not be that the cash flow patterns of the two policies are very haphazard so the profits of the negative non unit reserve policy should be arising in uh uh you know how should i say in a in a timely fashion to be able to cope up with the loss making uh policy make sense um can you repeat that please okay so there are two policies that we are considering one is profit making one is loss making yeah uh, in the profit making you are able to hold a negative non unit reserve because of that other policy because it has given a loan of a uh, mm -hmm. positive unit reserve in one sense right yeah yeah so say the uh, cash flow pattern of this uh, positive uh, of this negative non unit reserve policy because it's a profit making would you would expect the net net cash flows to be positive so i would mm -hmm. assume so the uh, cash flow pattern is 0034 okay yes. in mm -hmm. the next time periods but for the loss making policy say it's minus 2 minus 2 1 1 okay okay oh, so the yeah. positive cash flow here occurs at time 3 for the uh, profit making policy or the negative non unit policy okay is it in time for the cash flow or the, for the negative cash flow of the loss making policy mm. 
No, right? Because the negative cash flows are occurring here in time period one and two itself, and the first positive cash flow of the profit making policy is at time three. Three. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the rules will say that you can't use these two policies to subsidize each other. Okay. You yeah. should have a similar cash flow pattern, whether a uh, profit, whether profit making policies cash flow are able to supplement the cash flows of the uh, positive non unit reserves policy. uh well in time okay so the positive cash flow should arise at least before the negative cash flows yeah that's right yeah yes. thank you yeah clear all good till now yeah so this is broadly the gist of this chapter uh like you have other non cmp portion here as well but uh like like this is what the chapter mainly talks about unit reserves and non unit reserves in particular the gpu valuation method and what reserves are the next chapter is more extensive in terms of the solvency capital requirement where we'll talk about uh like the market consistent valuation the liquidity premiums and the risk margins and also the var approach and the active and uh, passive valuation approach we'll try to get that covered in the next weekend uh and then we'll be i think in a good position to get done with questions of booklet 1 and 2 cool any doubts for this chapter uh guys would we be comfortable for a class sometime in this during this week like uh do you have any plan leave where we'll be able to take any classes in the coming week um i can do in this week um off this week okay anushka for you yeah uh even i uh i'm on leave on till wednesday yeah so tuesday wednesday i can for oh, tuesday tomorrow and day after okay yeah, in that yeah. case i'll see whether i can take something day after does it work for you all Yeah. Uh, would uh, uh, would 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 sorry, would sorry, would six p.m. India time work for both of you? Six p.m. Yeah, it works. Yeah, time. Good. That would be twelve thirty for you, Lavanya. Yeah. Yeah. Works. Huh? Or do we yeah, want to? Yeah, I'm comfortable. Here? Okay, then I'll try to schedule something. I'll talk to Anshik and have something scheduled for Wednesday evening. Yeah, perfect. Good. Uh, perfect. so I just had question from your example uh, above uh, that you mm. were explaining for the uh, prudent reserve part. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Um, over there, uh, I got that point that we are uh, reaching to the zero at one plus. But yeah, just confused with uh, another one thing is that why are we doing like two, uh, like two minus four? If we have the positive net cash flow and already we had the reserve of two. So say this cash flow here was one. Okay. Then what would be my reserve at time one plus? Um, it would be, it would be one. It would be one, right? Because you have a cash yeah. flow of one, you already have a PV of outflow minus inflow of two, so one sets of two, but does not bring it down to negative. So you're not zeroizing it; you're holding a reserve of one. Okay. Now it makes sense. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got it now. Yeah. yeah. Cool. If there are no doubts, then we can close the class for the day, guys. Cool. Yeah. Ah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.